Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from Pillar 2 to South Korea's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Leader. The Pillar 2 engine from PwC is a game changer for Pillar 2 modeling, provision, and compliance calculations. Built on a graph system utilizing over 20 years of international tax technology, this centralized rules engine is built by a team of Pillar 2 tax experts from around the globe. PwC's Pillar 2 engine is currently available as a service and will be licensable in July 2024. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, we're at PwC's Asia PAC Global Tax Symposium in Singapore, where I'm excited to be joined by Michael Kim. Michael is an international tax partner in PwC South Korea and South Korea's outbound tax leader. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's an honor. <laughs> it's great. It's great to have you on. I was in South Korea with you. I think that was in December of last of, year of 2022, <laughs> which feels like four years ago I at know. this point. Um, but we were. It was the pending legislation. You know, we have discussed many times, and we're going to get into some of this, yes. but. Um, I was asked at a conference uh, earlier, uh, I think it was maybe later November, what, who was going to be the first country that was going to enact Pillar 2. <laughs> and it was your wise knowledge where I predicted South Korea and several people chuckled. And when South Korea actually enacted, which again, we'll get into, people were like, how did you know that? I was like, well, I have a good advisor in South Korea. So it's a big honor to have you on. Thank you. So before we begin and yep. jump into the Pillar 2 stuff, which I know the audience has a number of important questions for you, but we have had some time to spend time, we would spend some time together in South Korea and you had shared with me that you were educated in Montreal, Canada. You obviously now work in Seoul where we met. And between those times you had the opportunity to work in the US. Mm -hmm. Where were you based and tell us a little bit about that experience because I don't know if I would have necessarily expected you to end up where you ended up. Right. Uh, so between 2007 and 8 uh, I spent about a year and a half in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. I was actually working on a client's acquisition. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, it was Charlotte. <laughs> For a South Korean inbound investment, I presume, that, that brought you there? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And uh, I'm a big fan of the town of Charlotte. Did you ever make it to St. Louis by any chance? No, no, no. Okay. You know, it, it, back in 2007, eight, to, uh, eight days, it, it was a time of Stephen Curry, if you know. Uh, he, he was stationed at the Davidson College. Ah, uh, yes. And they did very well. And I know. Obviously, he went on for quite a career in the NBA. I know, but we never knew that he would be that popular uh, these days. Had I known that he would be that popular, we would have probably went to one or two games. <laughs> so are you now a, a, a fan of basketball, or were you a fan of basketball I am. before? I am. Well, now I am. Okay. I am. And who is your favorite NBA team? Los Angeles Lakers. The one of Los Angeles Lakers. All right. Yeah. Unfortunately, not the Charlotte Bobcats. Now, I was wondering if that might be the case. All right. Well, we don't have a team in St. Louis, so I will abstain from saying who my favorite team is uh, um, in the NBA. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to more important topics, but sure. I do enjoy hearing a little bit about your background. So Pillar 2 was enacted in Korea, and I think it's safe to say the first country to mm -hmm. enact Pillar 2 back in December 2022. That's correct. Remind uh, listeners actually what was enacted and those uh, effective dates. Yeah, so uh, back in December 2022, um, the, the basic rules of Pillar 2 were enacted. And, and the basic rules included uh, IIR and the UTPR, and they will be in effect from 2024, meaning January 1, 2024. Uh, QDMTT wasn't enacted. Uh, it's still up in the air, but I can definitely talk about uh, the, the legislative process and all that. Okay, so just to remind folks that so the income inclusion rule was a lot, was enacted effective 2024, mm -hmm. and Korea also enacted the under tax profit rule in 2024. It was really based on the model rules and commentary. I don't believe at that time the administrative guidance had had even come out. And then you mentioned it was silent on the QDMTT. We're obviously still waiting at this point. It's the end of June uh, 2023 for additional guidance on the QDMTT, but at this mm -hmm. point, South Korea legislation is, um, is, is silent on the QDMTT. So the UTPR enactment for 2024 is a year earlier than the revised OECD guidance that mm -hmm. generally suggests 2025. Right. This, Michael, as you know, has caused a lot of consternation around the globe. Mm -hmm. So again, we're recording this at the end of June 2023. 
Can we expect, Michael, the Korean tax administration or legislation to defer the application of the under tax profit rule to 2025? Absolutely. I think uh, both the UTPR and the QDMTT will enter into force from 25. Okay. So there will be a one-year deferral uh, in relation to uh, UTPR. Um, but the IR will likely stick with 2024 potentially? For now, for now. But there is a plan, a, a possibility uh, for a one-year deferral as well, even for IIR. Uh, but that's pending because uh, the Korean government wants to be cautious and wants to wait until uh, the developments in other countries and also how Korean, com uh, Korean taxpayers are coping with uh, Pillar 2 readiness. And so to the extent that Korean taxpayers are ready enough, then uh, probably they're going to uh, enforce it from 24. Okay. But otherwise, there's a potential of one year delay. And when and how does that announcement become official? Because I think many taxpayers have heard a lot of, you know, different commentary from folks in South Korea. Mm. How does that and when might that actually become it official? Do we need a, a, some sort of proclamation for the Ministry of Finance or how, how does that work? <laughs> so the Korean legislative process is that every, uh, towards the end of July, there's a draft legislation that gets published to the public. Yeah. And so uh, once the draft legislation comes out, it's usually December uh, when uh, the Congress passes the draft legislation and the president has to, has to sign to become uh, enacted. And so that's usually the process. So, so there is a possibility that come July of this year, um, the UTPR and the QDMTT rules may be stated in the draft legislation uh, to be one year deferred to 25, okay. which could be finalized for enactment in December of this year. So only in December that we would know for sure whether uh, both IIR and the UTPR together with the QDMTT will be deferred to 25 or just UTPR and QDMTT. Wow, so we'll, we'll know kind of what the intention is of the government Absolutely. in July, yep. but then we'll, we'll have to wait about with bated breath to see if it actually gets passed in December um, of 2022 or in 2023 for the UTPR to be effective in 2025. All right. Right, the, the, the reason being, I, I know some countries when the draft legis legislation comes out, it. It is almost final as it is, and there aren't that many changes to it. Sometimes for Korean uh, legislative processes, even the draft uh, legislation may dramatically change uh, in terms of the effective dates and, and stuff like that. And so uh, we still have to wait until December to really ascertain ourselves about the effective dates. Okay. Yeah. And so can you remind listeners or share with listeners why did South Korea have to enact these rules in December of 2022? Because I think that it is your legislative process that required you to have them enacted in 2022 for them to be effective even in 2024. But can you unpack that? Yeah, yeah. So like I said, every end of July, yeah. the draft legislation comes out and the, the law passes in December of that same year. So if you think about it, if, if, if the Korean government wants to, uh, in, wants to implement Pillar 2 from 24, they would have two choices. The first choice is to um, have published the draft legislation in July 2022 and make it final in December 2022 and give taxpayers one year window for I them see. to get ready. Otherwise, if they started this job in 23, then they wouldn't have a lot of time for the taxpayers to, prepare, to, to get themselves ready. Well, well Michael, tax, tax authorities and policymakers and legislators from around the globe should take note of that because <laughs> I think we're going to see a number of other countries that just enact the rules in December 2023 and they're going to be subject to 2024. But I, I, wow. I found it very interesting. You've shared with that with me before. Mm. It frankly makes a ton of sense, particularly for something as complex as Pillar 2. Absolutely. So I just have found it interesting. I've learned a lot about how the legislature process has worked around the globe and I thought mm. that has been fascinating and something that you predicted and shared that we would get that in 2022. Kind of sticking with that kind of legislative and procedural point, 
How will South Korea incorporate administrative guidance that came out after these rules were enacted, as well as future guidance? Does that need to be legislated, or is there a regulatory process? Yeah. How does that work in Korea to be able to incorporate future changes? Very good question. So if you understand the Korean legislative process, then it would, it would answer your question automatically. So the, uh, the IRR and the UTPR enactment that happened last December was really only covered, I would say, 30% of the model rules. It didn't even include all the stuff that's included in the commentary, right. in the OECD commentary. So what's enacted at the moment is just the basic rules and all the details that are related to the basic rules will be covered as part of the presidential decree that has yet to be released. Uh, the Korean government had originally planned to release the presidential decree related to um, Pillar 2 in February of this year. But because of all the uh, concerns raised by taxpayers, they decided to defer that uh, indefinitely. Um, so. We're not, we're not sure whether the Korean government will issue something out in July of this year as part of the draft legislation, mm -hmm. um, or they may defer it until the second half of this year, uh, towards the end of this year, or in a worst case scenario, until next February, which is 24 February. Okay. Yeah. And when the, does the presidential decree just come out once a year? Because one of the, the things that I would anticipate is that there's going to be constant addition, or well, at least maybe several different tranches, if you will, of administrative guidance. And that I would imagine even in the future, we might get, you know, next, even in a couple years, still get batches of, yep. of additional administrative guidance. Does the presidential decree come out once a year? Um, and then that's how those, those, the future administrative guidance would get incorporated, or how would that, what would that look like? Usually once a year. Okay. Usually once a year. I would expect a presidential decree related to Pillar 2 every year. Okay. Um, but uh, other than the presidential decree, we also do have sort of what we call basic interpretation, which is not the law itself, but a supporting um, legislative, I, I, I would say, guidance. Yeah to support both the law itself, which was enacted last year, yeah. and the presidential decree that's going to be released in the future. Got it. So it really depends on the nature of the administrative guidance and whether it's more you know, interpretive, I'm guessing, than mm -hmm. substantive. Is that a fair characterization? Right, right. Okay. Right. All right. Well, Michael, very informative, but we're not off the hook yet because I want to hear more yeah. about how South Korean taxpayers are really preparing for Pillar 2. So, yeah. Any trends you're seeing, or what does the current environment in South Korea look like for South Korean multinationals as they get prepared for this massive endeavor? So Korean taxpayers went through the same kind of denial phase, <laughs> like any other countries. Right. Like, so, but uh, these days, more and more taxpayers are getting ready, uh, as in uh, trying to get their um, uh, potential impact analysis yep. done. Uh, and also, they're, they're preparing for the safe harbor uh, rules and also the disclosure requirements as well. Uh, and some companies are more advanced uh, and, and they are preparing for the data catalog as in uh, the, what's going to be in the inputs mm -hmm. uh, and whether their entity level financial statements are correct or not. So some companies are even diving into those issues as well. Yeah, so it sounds very similar to what we're seeing uh, across the globe. And yeah. I think that as I've talked to, to different advisors and taxpayers around the globe, everybody thinks maybe they're more behind than others. But I yeah. think it's been pretty interesting here as we sit in mm -hmm. mid-2023 that there are certainly some taxpayers that are ahead. Mm -hmm. I think most taxpayers have realized, all right, it's time to do something, and they're starting their journey. So, Michael, how are tax departments generally structured in South Korea? Is it more centralized with a big tax department for taxpayers actually in, Korea, in South Korea? Or is it more decentralized where they let all the foreign subsidiaries generally do the compliance? Because mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I had the opportunity to talk to Shin from Japan, generally in Japan it was much more decentralized, relatively thin, you know, smaller tax department groups. Mm -hmm. What, what, is, what, what do you see from a South Korean perspective? Very similar to Japanese taxpayers. Okay. Korean taxpayers have a very decentralized tax functions, although not for all. 
obviously. Sure, sure, sure. But, but uh, the trend is that yeah. they would have a very thin tax department at the HQ level, and they would decentralize and have more like roles and responsibilities at the entity level when it comes to tax. Got it. Are most companies in Korea under IFRS, um, and how are they dealing with IS-12, which was the recent pronouncement from the International Accounting Standards Board that allowed for period accounting for Pillar 2, so generally Q1 of 2024, um, mm. but it also required disclosure requirements for 2023. Is that applicable for Korean filers, or how does that work in Korea? Yes, it does apply to Korean filers. Uh, Korea complies with Korean IFRS. So KIFRS. KIFRS, right. which is roughly the same as IFRS by itself. Okay. Um, in, uh, when it comes to I IAS 12, uh, the Korean Accounting Board, together with uh, accounting practitioners, are still debating as to whether the Korean rules that were enacted last December are substantial enactment, uh, substantially enough, so such that if for even for 23 purposes that we would have to do the disclosure, or whether we can wait until 24 for disclosure purposes. Okay. Um, that'll be interesting to, to see. I think for, I guess maybe the, the, the challenge will be even if the Korean rules are not substantially enacted to the extent that you have a Korean parented group that is operating in a jurisdiction that has substantially enacted the rules, presumably they'll need to do the tax accounting for those jurisdictions that have substantially enacted. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll make things a little challenging in that respect if, uh, if, we, yep. if we're not sure whether we have that disclosure in 2023 or 2024 for KIFRS tax Right, payers. right. My personal take is that it's, it, it probably should apply to 23 as well, even for Korea. But like I said, it's still up in the air. Okay. We're going to have to see. All right. We'll keep an eye on that. Yep. So let's turn now to um, the, the safe harbors and specifically the country by country report. I think as you know, we've talked to a number of taxpayers and advisors around the globe, it's where many taxpayers are, are starting their analysis. Mm. Um, what are you seeing from a South Korean perspective? Are you running into the same challenges that we're seeing elsewhere with respect to whether country by country reports are qualifying? And what are you seeing uh, generally from a safe harbor perspective? Yeah, so some, some taxpayers uh, have a concern that some of their uh, CBC reports may not qualify uh, because, uh, for instance, like permanent establishments, to the right. extent that they have permanent establishments, uh, their financial statements may not be fit for uh, purposes of the qualified CBCR on their right. Pillar 2 rules for, for uh, safe harbor purposes. And so they're starting to uh, redo their, their financial statements uh, in a way that it could be fit for Pillar 2 purposes. Yeah, and that issue that you mentioned on the permanent establishment is obviously relevant for country by country re reporting purposes, also important from a globe income, yep. right, for the full yep. Pillar 2 calculations. And I think that has been a common theme where maybe the permanent establishment isn't otherwise material for financial statement purposes mm -hmm. or for other reasons that companies do not have a separate P&L or balance sheet for the permanent establishment. It just rolls into the owner of the, the permanent establishment. And obviously for purposes of both country by country report as well as the full globe income, that needs to be broken out. And that is a big kind of challenge from a financial yeah. statement perspective. Yeah. One other thing is that uh, for local uh, uh, you know, entity level, uh, some CBC reports uh, will prepare based on local gap. And some local gaps may not be fit for uh, qualified CBC report purposes. And therefore, uh, that is also a challenge. Yeah, and I think that's one of the technical questions that yeah. many of us have had is that the, the language could be clearer in the model rules and commentary with respect to what constitutes a qualifying financial statement, yep. for, per, particularly for purposes of the country by country rules. Yep. Yep. And um, I, I think all of us would welcome additional guidance about Absolutely. whether you have to use the financial accounting system of the ultimate parent entity or whether you can use kind of the local accounting, the local statutory accounting standards to be a qualifying country by country report. The other challenge that we're seeing in the UK recently in their administrative guidance mentioned that even if one jurisdiction kind of disqualifies under the country by country report, that it does not disqualify the entire 
mm -hmm. country by country report. Yeah. And that was kind of a, a question that we had. Well, if you have kind of one bad PE, as mm -hmm. you had mentioned, does that tank the whole thing? Yeah. And uh, so I think, you know, the UK has mentioned that. Hopefully we'll see that in the next administrative guidance, but another really important issue. Yeah, that is the same. We also do have interpreted uh, the pillar two model rules and, and the commentary in the same manner, in a sense that even if one jurisdiction may not qualify, uh, you know, other jurisdictions may still qualify if their uh, CBC reports are qualified CBC reports. And is that in, gui that in prescribed guidance at this point or just the, the general view? Um, I would say that's, that's our interpretation. Yeah. Um, like you said, uh, yeah, it, it would be helpful if we have Absolutely. more of administrative guidance to uh, straighten things out. Okay. So let's kind of go along those lines of kind of financial statements and really data collection. Mm -hmm. um, what challenges are you seeing from a data perspective? Obviously, you'd already mentioned one, the, the permanent establishment, uh, um, but any other examples or challenges, particularly with the granularity of information that's required? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing first, it's, it's the local financial statements, whether the local financial statements are correct and have been prepared uh, you know, uh, consistent with the UP or the, the ultimate parent company's entity's uh, uh, financial standards. Right. Uh, the other thing is because taxpayers were not used to getting data uh, prepared and gathered in a way that would be sufficient for pillar two adjustments. One example is say investment companies that a UP per, per, perhaps has. Right. And for, in order to um, accurately compute the adjustments, you would have to segregate between those investment companies or investment ownerships that are less than 10%, right. that are over 10%, and that are one year, uh, one year or less, or that are one year or over. And then you would have to segregate between the four and the data provision or the the data process has to be managed in that way in order for tax practitioners to be able to to uh, to be able to accurately make the adjustments. Right for the dividends that are coming from for those. for dividends, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's one perfect example of how how much struggle uh, and challenges taxpayers would have because they have never been accustomed to. Uh, uh, pulling data in that way. Right. Um, one of the other, I know, you, I say unique or interesting, I should say, aspects of the Korean regime is that is you offer a foreign tax credit for uh, taxes assessed on a permanent establishment. Yeah. So yeah. Um, this is an issue that, that we deal with in the U.S. quite a bit. So mm -hmm. um, how have you been thinking about kind of the allocation of those income taxes between the headquarter company and the permanent establishment? Uh, that's quite a challenge because uh, at the HQ level, the Korean HQ level, the, because of the Korean legislative, pro, uh, the Korean tax code itself, uh, any taxes paid outside Korea as in, in, in the location of the permanent establishment would be used as a foreign tax credit and all the income that's picked up it, at, the, at the permanent establishment level will also be subject to Korean taxes with the foreign tax credit. Right. And so the allocation between what portion of the Korean taxes is attributable to purely to the HQ and what portion should be attributable to the permanent establishment and whether the, the attri attribution or the allocation, uh, how, how these foreign tax credits come into play and whether if, if there's any other uh, tax credits uh, strictly related to the HQ, whether a portion of it should be also allocable to the permanent es establishment. I mean, it, it's a chaos. There, it, this is a very, very difficult process to allocate taxes between the HQ and the permanent establishment. My, all I will say is the U.S. practitioners that are listening to this are generally saying, welcome to the club. <laughs> so we have been, we've been addressing and yep. dealing with this issue, and you're absolutely right. It's incredibly, incredibly challenging. Yep. And yep. Uh, um, I, I, it's just welcoming to, to hear that uh, we're not the only ones that, that are having <laughs> to deal with some of those challenges. Yeah. So let me turn now to the idea of, of covered taxes. 
and particularly some of the, the credits and incentives. So a lot of large Korean companies, obviously you have you know, one of the largest tech industries on the planet, amongst other industries that invest in the US heavily and are planning to take advantage of green energy credits from the US Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the chips incentives for semiconductors, for those that aren't familiar with that. So what is the approach as for Korean multinationals on whether these are good covered taxes, particularly as those mm -hmm. Korean taxpayers need to make investment decisions in the U.S.? Are mm -hmm. they conservative mm -hmm. and just assume, well, they're not going to be good covered taxes and you're going to pay a top-up tax with the IR? Mm -hmm. What is the general approach? The general approach with, with these taxpayers is that they take a very conservative position. Yeah and uh, any U.S. tax incentives they get out of CHIPS Act or the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, would be subject to a Pillar 2 adjustment, uh, subject to top-up tax in Korea. Yeah. yeah, and I recorded a podcast, several podcasts ago, with Pat Brown on this very issue, and I think there are some technical positions out there to help support, and obviously depends on the type of the credit, and whether you know direct pay versus transferable, mm -hmm. Um, and, and so depending on the type of the credit and the fundamental nature of that, that some of those may, there may be a technical argument, but mm. it is less than clear mm. in the OECD guidance currently about whether those are good cover taxes or not. Right. And so I do think it's interesting that generally that the Korean investment are just saying, listen, just plan on a top up tax because that could really obviously be a really significant number and mm -hmm. can really alter and change investment decisions that Korean companies are making if they think they're going to be paying a, an additional top-up tax in, in the U.S. And so um, as part of the podcast that I did with Pat, we mm -hmm. talked about some of the guidance that we received in the last administrative guidance on tax equity structures, but really was silent on the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. Well, the tax equity structures are not really... Uh, a, a, a topic of interest to most Korean taxpayers, uh, especially that are looking to invest in the U.S. under the CHIPS Act or IRA. Uh, if there is a, a positive uh, ruling or administrative guidance related to U.S. incentives being with that, that we can use as a cover tax, then that's good. But for now, for planning purposes and everything, Korean companies tend to take a, a prudent stance and, and uh, potentially they, they expect a uh, top-up tax out of Korea be okay. due to their investments in the U.S. Got it. All right, so last question then. Always like to hear from, from advisors. What advice do you have for taxpayers in both South Korea and we're at our Asia PAC mm. um, conference. So what, do you, what, what advice do you have for both South Korean and Korean taxpayers and the region as they prepare for Pillar 2? Because the model rules, the commentary, and uh, one, one set of administrative guidance is already released, and we would know exactly how the Korean presidential decree will be enacted, um, I, would, I strongly, strongly recommend to Korean taxpayers to roll up their sleeves and start preparing for it now, sooner than later, because one way or another, it's, it's, it's not, you cannot avoid this. The storm is coming, and for you to be re as ready uh, as quickly as possible, it's just going to benefit, uh, benefit more because the more you understand the rules and the more uh, you understand the elections, whether they're beneficial to you or whether they're detrimental to you, the more leverage you have in planning your, for, for your investments, for your uh, 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 subsidiaries and everything. So, you know, get... Get, get the planning uh, done as quickly as possible and get ready. Are you pillar two ready? Are you All pillar right. two ready? <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, very insightful. I think listeners were going to have learned a lot, particularly about mm. the Korean legislative process. We'll continue to monitor closely to see if that under tax profit rule gets postponed or at least gets mm. delayed until 2025. But very informative. Thank you very much for contributing to the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. It's a great pleasure having me with you. Thank you All very right. much. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Michael Kim, a Seoul, South Korea-based PwC International Tax Partner. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Leader. Stay tuned for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast.
This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.